Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. There we are. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, so very good morning again. I'm Nicole Schnackenberg. I'm one of the educational psychologists at Southend Educational Psychology Service. And I'm really delighted to be talking this morning about singing for well-being. And also um, surprised to be talking about that because um, surprised and delighted. It was one of the topics suggested by a young person who completed one of the forms. We have forms for people to fill in, to suggest topics for the webinars and any form filled in by a young person, we're very, very, very committed to making sure we cover that content. And the most recent form from a young person, and we thank you wholeheartedly, was asking for something about singing. So here we are talking this morning and perhaps in a, a very timely moment, about singing for well-being. So the history of singing and music for well-being. So we have to go all the way back to Pythagoras, that mathematician in the sixth century, who is um, supposed to be the first person to have used music therapeutically, at least the first person recorded to have done so. And then it takes us all the way until the Second World War when people begin singing and playing music to the soldiers that are injured and noticing decreased incidences of depression, increased emotional expression and also an improved sense of morale that as humanity we really begin to think, oh, there's something in this. There's something really beneficial in singing and sharing music. And then this led in the 1950s to studies being undertaken in earnest into the benefits of singing for mental health and well-being. And it was really in the 1990s that the bulk of research into singing specifically for mental health and well-being began to emerge. And there are many studies and you might enjoy going into Google Scholar to look some of them up. And I'm just going to give a little flavour this morning of some of the areas that feel particularly pertinent to the current times that we're in. And as soon as 1980, and these three principles have been reiterated in later pieces of research, there were three basic principles underlying the effectiveness of music and singing found. So this aspect of social identity, social connection, the fact that music and singing helps us to feel part of a group and enhances feelings of belongingness, also increases self-esteem and improves self-concept as well and that links to the first point and then this really interesting aspect of a sense of rhythm being used to energize and bring order so you know when we listen to music that can also support our temporal understanding because of the the cadence and the rhythm of the music and the song that we might be playing or listening to and indeed, we all have a rhythm. Our bodies have rhythms in rhythms of sleep and awakeness, rhythms of digestion. We have a rhythm of the heartbeat, a rhythm of the breathing rate. All of us have a certain rhythm by the way we walk. You know, we can recognize people often um, from the rhythm of the way that they walk. And all of these rhythms give a certain flavor to our lives, but also have a certain effect on the nervous system. And actually just by bringing um, different sorts of rhythm into our lives, we can invite sense of all the sense of order into the brain and into our felt sense of the nervous system as well. And of course, music and singing exist cross culturally and have long been used as a way of marking ritual of marking rites of passage. Music and singing are also a part of all major traditions and religions, spiritual traditions and religions, again, cross-culturally. And here in the UK, you know, we, we might feel that we don't perhaps sing together as a group as often as we may have done in the past. We're seeing some of that re-emerging now, of course, but we still have some traditions, um, many of us that remain quite fixed. So the singing of the happy birthday, we might do that in schools as well, in family homes. Uh, we might be doing it across um, the phone at the moment, singing happy birthday to those that we love. 
And I feel that when, you know, we, we heard last night that there's some thinking about transition now back to school for some young people, some year groups. I feel that this will be a really nice way to invite a sense of belongingness and, and a sense of we've been thinking of you, we've missed you, and we, we've cared about you while you were away, perhaps marking the birthdays of all the children that have, you know, at, during the time when children and young people have been at home, noticing the birthdays we've missed and maybe singing birthdays, happy birthday to those children. Also um, singing carols at Christmas, um, singing lullabies to babies and singing at um, events such as funerals as well. So we sing to share emotion, that's a big part of singing, to socially connect and to express shared emotion with one another. And as I mentioned, in recent times, we're seeing this emerge in different ways. So here's an image from Italy. And we heard about the, the Italians who went into lockdown before us here in the UK um, singing from their balconies, singing to one another, singing with one another, and this supporting a sense of solidarity and lifting the spirits, lifting the morale in the same way we saw in those early studies of soldiers in the Second World War. And in the UK, of course, we have our clapping, so we are making sound there for the NHS on a Thursday. And certainly in my street, and I know in other streets, on Friday for VE Day, um, you know, there was some bunting in the street and some people also singing together um, to mark VE Day. So song and singing as a way of connecting socially appears to be re-emerging in the current time and for, for understandable reasons and long may it continue, I hope. So there are so many benefits of singing and as I mentioned a number of studies so I've just picked out a few aspects here to talk about this morning and one of them is increased immunity through the mechanism of increased immunoglobin A. So we have here two studies, one from the University of Frankfurt and one based in California, where choral singing, singing as part of a group, increased levels of immunoglobin A. This was measured through the saliva. So singing can boost and support our immune system. It's a wonderful thought. And actually, in those two studies that I just showed you, not only did they find increased levels of, of immunoglobin A in the saliva, they also found decreased levels of cortisol, as did this other study um, cited here. And actually, Kruitz, if that's the way you say it, um, has done a lot of studies into the benefits of singing in these areas. So cortisol being that stress hormone related to the stress response. So singing can support a decrease of that, of that cortisol. Also very cool, I think. And then we have aspects of circulation and blood oxygenation being improved and enhanced through the mechanism of singing. Also reductions in blood pressure also. And when we sing, we exercise the major muscle groups in the upper chest which is also really important at this current time because that can, as well as support the uh, muscle, can also support them, um, can support breathing. So here's the diaphragm, that muscle that really does, um, really is strongly implicated in the experience of breathing. So as we inhale, the diaphragm moves down to allow the air to come into the lungs, to allow the lungs to expand. And as we exhale, the diaphragm moves up, pushing the air out of the lungs. And as we know, singing can really strengthen that di diaphragm and therefore support us in that mechanism of breathing. There we are. So we could sit there with books on our head for our posture. And there are all manner of other things we can do to support our posture. And one of them is singing, actually. So through singing, we strengthen those core muscles, which support us to, to sit and stand upright. But also when we sing, the spine is invited to lengthen. We, we tuck in the chin so that we are opening through the throat, reaching up through the crown of the head. And this, while singing, supports the posture, but then also sets up muscle memory for that improvement in posture in general. And again, we're working those muscles as well that support, 
support their maintenance of a good posture, which can have big implications for you know, back pain and, and also for breathing, actually. It's difficult to breathe uh, fully and completely when our chest is collapsed. However, when the shoulders are back and down, the chin is tucked, reaching up through the crown of the head, we open through the chest and therefore um, increase the capacity for us to have a long, deep breath which is so very supportive to the oxygenation of our blood, but also to the balance of our nervous system. And as if we needed more research, we have another couple of pieces here. There's that quote again. Um, with the sense that when we sing, endorphins are released, endorphins being those feel-good hormones. And also um, when we sing, we can increase the release of oxytocin, oxytocin being often fondly referred to as the cuddle hormone, the social connection hormone. So the, in the, through those two mechanisms, in and of themselves, so supporting a sense of well-being and, and um, felt sense of happiness and also supporting a sense of social bonding, these can also decrease the sensation of pain. So pain might still be there, but through the presence of the endorphins, our experience of the distress related to that pain can be diminished. So singing for pain relief. And again, there's a lot of um, research emerging around, around the use of singing in places like hospitals and A&E as well um, to reduce experiences of pain and support experiences of well-being. And singing is also, of course, a workout for the brain and a workout, as we'll come to in a moment, for many different parts of the brain. Through the mechanisms of rhythm and melody and harmony, we're stimulating very complex cognitive process, processes, emotive process and sensory motor processes in the brain as well. Um, and one study there, just mentioning that, and supporting short-term memory, long-term memory, and also working memory. And a bulk of the research in this area is into um, experiences like dementia. So um, studies that have demonstrated that singing with people in the early stages of dementia can slow that process. And also singing songs from the past, as we were doing out there on the street for VE Day, for example, in my neighbourhood on Friday, can, to, can bring back some of those memories, but also support a sense of well-being as well. And of course, our brain is split into two main hemispheres. We have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere with the corpus callosum in the middle, which transmits messages between the left and the right. And the way the brain is organized is such that we have to inhibit one hemisphere before we can inhabit the other. They have inhibitory functions on one another. So the left hemisphere is the logical linear hemisphere. It's where the majority of us have their language centre lateralised there in the left hemisphere. And then we have the right hemisphere, which as depicted by the picture is more the emotive hemisphere of the brain. It's where emotion processing is lateralised into receptive awareness. The lived experience of the body from the inside is lateralised. So experiences like the heartbeat, the breathing rate, hunger and fullness signals. But it's also where musicality is lateralized and singing as well. So what's really fascinating is, is that when we sing, we're stimulating the language side on the left and the musicality side on the right, and therefore supporting the simultaneous activation of both hemispheres of the brain and this communication between the corpus callosum in the middle. And I've certainly met, uh, including recently, many children who um, and, and, and I'm sure adults as well, but I work with children, so I've met a lot of children who can't necessarily speak in fluent sentences and yet are able to sing whole songs. And it's because the, these experiences, talking and singing, emerge from different um, aspects, different parts of the brain. So therefore, we can use song and singing uh, with those children, but with all of us to, to support speech and language and support social connection and, and communication as well. And another little interesting anecdote is that music in the major chord 
is processed predominantly or lateralized in the left hemisphere of the brain, the logical hemisphere of the brain. And music in the minor chord lateralized to the right hemisphere of the brain. So we might find, and definitely in my experience of listening to music and of singing, I'm very drawn to songs and pieces of music in the minor chord because of that emotive aspect of it, because of the way it invites quite strong and tender emotions to emerge within me. And if we go back to one of the earlier slides where we spoke about rhythm bringing order, you know, music in the major chord that's got sort of an ostinato, a repeated uh, musical phrase and repeated quite um, organised rhythm can support that sense of organisation. So if we're feeling a bit chaotic, a bit out of sorts, a bit overwhelmed by emotions, we might find regulating pieces of music like that with quite a stable rhythm in the major chord potentially very, very um, organising, containing and soothing. And as I mentioned, implications therefore for speech and language. So it's just one study here, a very small study. However, with um, the majority of the, so we, what did we have? We had eight adults and six received singing three times a week for 30 minutes for three weeks and two comprised the control group. So of those six that received the intervention, 60%, 67% of them made improvements in speech whilst controlling for other variables. So using singing in speech and language therapy is also something definitely worth thinking about and inviting and encouraging children that struggle with speech, language and communication to sing and to make sound. You know, it doesn't have to be words, anything where there's the sound and rhythm and that, that felt sense of connection with the right hemisphere of the brain is likely to be very, very supportive in all sorts of ways. And I can't speak about singing without mentioning the vagus nerve. So this is something we mentioned in a previous webinar when we spoke about the nervous system and also spoke about breathing practices. And there the vagus nerve is depicted in yellow. It's vaga, the vagrant, the wanderer, known as the wandering nerve. It's a huge nerve and it wanders throughout the viscera of the body. And if you look up there, it also wanders to the middle ear and to the larynx. So it's definitely connected with the voice and connected with social interaction and social engagement. And when we sing, we, we stimulate the vagus nerve because it runs down the back of the throat. So when we move the vocal cords, we stimulate that nerve. And also when we sing, we naturally lengthen the exhalation. And when we naturally lengthen the exhalation, we also stimulate the vagus nerve. And this is so important because the vagus nerve is a parasympathetic nerve. So it's the nerve associated and main nerve associated with the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the energy conserving branch of the autonomic nervous system, the rest and digest branch. And this is again what's so beautiful about singing. So not only when we sing do we stimulate both hemispheres of the brain, but we also stimulate both branches of the autonomic nervous system. You know, through the energy and the cadence and the rhythm, we're stimulating the sympathetic. And then through the mechanism, mechanism of lengthening the exhale and stimulating the, um, the vagus nerve, we're stimulating the parasympathetic. So what we're essentially doing is we're training the nervous system. We're stimulating the sympathetic, we're stimulating the parasympathetic. And as we stimulate them both simultaneously, we begin to support them to come into a sense of balance and support therefore ourselves to come into a sense of balance as well. And here's some great ways to stimulate the vagus nerve. Singing is one, humming, mm, stimulates the vagus nerve. Rapping, drilling, there's Benjamin Zephaniah, the poet. I highly recommend listening to him rapping his poems. He's amazing. And gargling actually stimulates the vagus nerve. So we can try any of those things to begin to support our nervous systems come into a state of balance. And there's a humming bee. Um, just to remind me to mention that in the breathing practices webinar, we spoke about the humming bee breath as well. So we can just hum, hmm, which is a lovely thing to do as we're going about our daily business. Um, you know, if members of our family hum and we find it irritating, maybe we can reframe that and remind ourselves they're stimulating their parasympathetic nervous system, they're soothing, they're balancing their nervous system, they're releasing endorphins and you know, all of these wonderful things. And maybe we can join them, you know, 
um, and find ourselves therefore perhaps feeling less irritated and, and enjoying the experience ourselves. We can practice the humming bee breath, which is inhaling through the nose. The lips are closed and then we hum the breath out. Mm. And we can try that at different pitches. And something I've enjoyed experimenting with in my life is finding where different pitches resonate at different points in the body. So when I have a headache, for example, I find if I resonate at quite a high pitch, I can almost feel the resonation up in my skull. And that seems to support the soothing of that headache. I can really feel that up here. So you can play around with it and find different pitches within the body with the humming. And of course, in Western society, or, you know, I shouldn't generalise, but in a huge section of Western society, we have Westernised music, we have the Westernised scale. And therefore, lots of narratives and stories about singing and about voice and about singing in tune. And it's remarkable how many of us have received and digested and assimilated narratives about our voice. We can't sing, our voice is crackly, we're half a tone out, we're too loud, we're too quiet, um, we're too shrill, we're too deep, all of these things, um, often from childhood as well, and we might have assimilated these messages from teachers and parents, and we might still be assimilating these messages where, you know, inadvertently, adults might be saying, oh, you know, I would sing, but I'd clear the room if I sang, or... Um, we could have a song now, but you know, I can't sing, so I wouldn't be able to lead you in that song. And that really gives a message that, we, that singing can be done in the right way and the wrong way. And I think that's a travesty because singing is our birthright. Singing is what a, is a huge part of what it is to be human. It's a huge part of what it is to express ourselves, uh, a significant way in which we can socially connect. And therefore my invitation this morning for us to consider is that it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if we're half a tone out or we've got a crackly voice. It's, it's the love we bring to it and the intention we bring to it. And I always think about how when a baby cries, the mother responds, the father responds, the caregiver responds, it pulls at the heartstrings, not because it's in a certain pitch and tone, but because that's what the human voice is, is designed to do. It's designed to reach out to others and draw others towards us and to touch our hearts in ways that we, we can't express through the Western scale. And who's to say that's what half, a tone, what half a tone out in the Western scale is, is not the perfect pitch and tone for us, for our vibration, for our rhythm, for our cadence, for our nervous system. So an invitation to consider music cross-culturally um, and to think about all the different ways we can use the voice whatever we fancy you know rapping beatboxing I, I saw a beatboxer last year and it blew my mind and actually he's been invited to to universities for linguists to study him because they're amazed at what he can do with his voice experimenting with and enjoying the voice in whichever way we feel drawn to and letting go of those narratives about whether we have a good voice or not and I love this quote. You know, the bird song seems to be resplendent at the moment. It's such a backdrop of our current experience. And if the only birds that sang were the birds that sang the best, the woods would be silent. And how very sad that would be. So an invitation to make singing, humming, whistling, part of our daily schedule. We can schedule it in. We can decide, okay, you know, when I'm revising, I can, I can hum that may, might support my revision. When I'm cooking the dinner or laying the dinner table, we can hum as a family. Um, when I'm taking my shower, I can hum. When we're driving in the car, we can have a sing song. And also just those spontaneous times when we fancy it and supporting each other, not making comments about whether we're in tune or anything like that, but rather just celebrating the the joy of singing and singing together. 
singing in the shower is a special one because because of the the water and because of the hard surfaces of the shower the the sound is reaching our ears at different speeds which gives a certain richness to the sounds it can actually make us sound better to ourselves um, so singing in the shower can be a lot of fun as well in the bath wherever really sing anywhere i would say so pulling out old CDs, old records or whatever it is that we have and singing along. If we've got an old dusty instrument somewhere in the attic, pulling it down, doesn't matter if we can't play it well. It really doesn't, you know, having a fiddle about, making up our own chords, why not? Perhaps making some musical instruments, some yogurt pots, some um, brown paper, some dried pasta or dried beans, and we have a shaker. We can sing along with the shaker. Don't need to know any musical notes for that. And I feel that singing will be an important part of our return, our transition back to school. It's a very inclusive activity. You know, children that cannot or struggle to um, speak fluently, many of them can sing, and those that can't can make sound. And those that can't make sound can shake something and enjoy the vibrations. Children that have auditory um, difficulties, they can also experience those vibrations and they might like to take their shoes and socks off to feel those vibrations under the feet. But coming together as a school community and singing as a school community is very likely going to support that sense of belongingness, that sense of coming back togetherness. And if you're a young person and you like that, you know, feel free to speak to your teachers, um, your heads of year and say, look, there's something I'd really like to do or to start your own group. So let's come together as young people who like to sing a couple of lunch times a week and just pick our favourite tunes and, and sing our hearts out, sing our hearts in without worrying uh, what, what, what it sounds like. When we sing together, the heart, our heartbeats begin to entrain and synchronise. We literally, our hearts literally beat as one when we sing together as a group. And I'll leave you with this um, experiment that was actually conducted by IKEA, the, um, the furniture giant, where two plants were put in a school, I think in the United Arab Emirates, and in the corridor of a school, and children were asked to hurl abuse, really, at the plant on the left, to bully the plant on the left, oh, you, you're not even green, and this sort of a thing, and then to say real, really kind words to um, the plant on the right. Plants were given the same amount of sunlight and water. And here's what happened. So this idea that the human voice, of course, the, the words themselves, but also the tone of the voice, the way we use our voices can really build us up or tear us down. And singing is very, very much part of that. It'd be nice to do a similar experiment with song and see plants that were sung to. There is a beautiful book, actually, The Secret Life of Plants, that explores some of those aspects. But as human beings, as I was reminded myself recently when I was in conversation with someone, um, that I'd read that it's something that made me laugh, this idea that as human beings, we're essentially complicated house plants. Um, you know, we, we, we need very basic things, really. And I, I believe one of those very basic things we need is song and music for our nourishment, for our pleasure and our well-being. So this is from a poem, a Spanish poem, and one of my favourite songs. Uh, Dejemos al menos flores, de, de, dejemos al menos cantos. Let us at least leave flowers, let us at least leave songs. So let's plant flowers, let's sing songs together and give ourselves that pleasure, but also that that beauty and that connection with one another. So I thought we can hardly talk about singing without singing. So this, um, this is an Irish blessing and it was shared actually by Deborah Mainwaring who, was, uh, who is an educational psychologist who came on to share a webinar with us, a lovely webinar a couple of weeks ago now. And the words are, may the long time sun shine upon you or love surround you and the pure light within you guide your way on. And then we'll just finish with a couple of satnams. That's in Gurmukhi, that's an ancient Indian language, with sat meaning truth and nam meaning identity. So connecting to that true self that British psychoanalyst and um, paediatrician Donald Winnicott spoke about. So sending each other a little Irish blessing 
and then reminding ourselves of our true self. And I believe singing can really support us to have a sense of that true self. So let's have a go. And um, I'm going to use the guitar. If you've got something you want to play along with or shake, um, then feel free. I'll just sing this through a few times. Give myself space to actually strum the guitar. Okay. May the long time sun shine upon you, all the world around you, and the pure light within you, guiding your way. Thank you, everybody, for singing with me this morning and for coming along to listen. Um, I'll stop the screen share, and if there are any little questions, um, otherwise I'll leave you with that from my heart to yours. Um, I have a question here. Thank you. Could singing help us to re-establish bonds and relationships when we are back at school? I really think that it can. I think marking the things that we've experienced together, like clapping for the NHS, and maybe bringing that in into schools, of course, at a different time, but validating those ex collective experiences of making sound together and carrying that over into school. Marking those birthdays, as I mentioned, you know, not, not just allowing them to go on by, but singing happy birthday to the children and young people and, and the teachers and adults and support staff who've been away spending time over that and coming together for assemblies as classes as groups um, however that's going to be with the social social distancing measures but finding a way to share music and song I think is going to be so important for that sense of belongingness and that reintegration process absolutely vital I feel um, somebody's here is reflecting on whether singing could be including in EHCP, EHC psychological advice to support with emotional well-being, speech and language development. It sounds like there is good research evidence to support these interventions. What are your thoughts? I think so, yes. Um, actually, in a piece of advice I wrote not so long ago, I was really touched by how um, a group of nursery staff were using something they were calling musical communication 
for a child who uh, struggled with speech and language but could sing whole songs, whole nursery rhymes, whole um, um, theme tunes to favourite cartoons and Disney, um, Disney films. So I think absolutely, and I wove that very much into my advice of how, how that could be continued and enhanced as well. Lovely way for um, children to socially interact as well. There's a lovely program called Rhythm to Recover, which is all through the use of drums, sitting in a circle with you know, small djembe drums or whatever it is, and um, communicating to each other through the use of the drum. So, you know, in that instance, the voice isn't used, although at certain points in that program, the voice is, of course, also brought in. So finding ways to use sound and music to connect. I love the idea of musical instruments supporting singing and sharing what we have done when young people return to education settings. Yeah, I, I think so too. Okay, that's really lovely. Um, lovely questions and thoughts. So let us, dejemos a menos flores, dejemos a menos cantos, let us at least leave flowers and let us at least leave songs. Wishing you all a very lovely day and looking forward to hopefully seeing you for some of the other webinars we have this week. Um, tomorrow I'll be speaking to Dr. Amita Jassy, consultant clinical psychologist from the Maudsley, about big and overwhelming worries at this time. So if you're having big and overwhelming worries at this time, you may find that useful. Dr. Jassy is, is, is wonderful, very knowledgeable and insightful. Have a lovely day, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>